Hey guys, I'm a Forester here, and it's time for another coffee review. Now it's been a whole month since I've made a video, so I feel like I'm making my first video all over again. Maybe it'll be better, I don't know. But we're going to review another coffee by Kicking Horse Coffees. This is a Canadian brewer, or roaster, and uh, I've already reviewed one. It was the last coffee review that I did. It was 454 horsepower coffee, and if you remember or you want to go back and watch that, that was probably one of two coffees that I've reviewed that was my favorite of all. You know, this one, I've been drinking this for a while, and I've actually saved this coffee enough to do this review for probably a month or so. And I'll just go ahead and say I like this coffee, but we'll see if I like it as much as the 454. Now, Kicking Horse Coffee donated the 454. I liked it so much that I went out and bought Kick-Ass Coffee, and that's what we're going to be reviewing today kick-ass coffee. So I'm uh, brewing it in my French press and it's time to go ahead and press the coffee. It's been in there for four to five minutes. I have not been using this French press a lot and in fact somebody left a comment that said there's some negative aspects of drinking French press coffee because of all the grounds and some of the chemicals that are in it. So I just drink it mainly for reviews and when I want a special cup of coffee. And I'm using my vintage Krispy Kreme cup again. There we go. And one thing I like about Kicking Horse Coffee, they put their own review on the bag, and it's right here. See if you can read that. It says sweet, smoky, and audacious. Now, 454 horsepower, I felt like they were very accurate with their description of their coffee. We'll see if we think it's sweet, smoky, and audacious. Here goes, first sip of the day. That is hot. This is a strong cup of coffee. There's no bitter notes to it at all. So if you don't like, if you like strong coffee, but you don't like the bitterness of, um, say, a French roast, I think I pick up the most bitterness out of a French roast that some people don't like. This doesn't have any of that. So if you like a strong cup of coffee with no bitterness, you will like this. Okay. The sweet, it does have a very slight sweet taste to it. It has a slight smoky taste to it. Those are two of their adjectives that they use. You know, I don't know how to describe that smoky flavor to it. Usually, you know, when you're tasting anything, I watch a lot of food reviews and uh, when you're tasting something and describing it it's usually such a subtle note that it's hard to describe but I will say it does have a very slight smoky flavor to it I think that's very uh, accurate the one I would maybe disagree with is audacious it is different it's unique uh, I don't think I would use the word audacious maybe I would use smooth um, you know, but it is a good coffee. I'll give this, it's not quite as good as 454 horsepower coffee. So of those two, I would lean toward 454 horsepower. But this is a good coffee that I'll try again. I'll, um, I'll buy another bag of it and I'll drink it. It won't be my regular drink, but I do like it. And I'm going to finish this off. I've actually had a pot of coffee already. This was my first sip of, of um, this particular coffee, but I've already had a cup, and my hands tend to do this when I have that much coffee. I do have some notes over here that I'm referring to, and I just wanted to do uh, some uh, discussion of a few things that have come up lately. And the first thing I wanted to do is promote, do a shout out for this channel right here, and that's Camp and Camera, Camp and Camera. My printer messed up the black ink, and so that should be uh, in black font. But anyway, that's a channel that I think that you would enjoy. 
if you're into woodworking, into camping, or into photography, uh, this is a gentleman that I met at a forestry meeting a couple of weeks ago. We got started talking about YouTube, and he just started a YouTube channel. He only has four or five videos, but I was really impressed. I'll be talking about experts in YouTube. Well, he's, a, he's an expert in those uh, subject matters, woodworking, camping, photography. And so I think you'll enjoy, if you're interested in any of those subjects, you'll enjoy his channel. Go by and look up Camp and Camera and tell him I'm a forester sent you. Now I wanted to talk about our last trip to China. We are just now, we got back one month ago and we're just now getting over the jet lag and the weariness from that whole trip. We go through phases and right now we're in that phase. I don't know how long it lasts. It's a month to two months where we say we're never going back to China again and you know that sounds harsh but the trip is so hard on us we're in our mid 60s the trip is so hard on us that we go through that phase and then gradually over time it wears off the pain of the trip is forgotten and then we start wanting to see our grandchildren again and we're willing to make that trip and we typically go back every six months but right now we have no plans to ever go back to China again every trip to China is an adventure and this trip was no different in fact this might have been the most adventurous trip of all <clears throat> once we get where we're going Hangzhou China everything's fine everything works out we're used to the routine of the day that we uh, just play grandparents and walk my granddaughter to school pick her up and that type thing but getting there and getting back is the adventure. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll tell you a little bit about this trip. But on the way over there, we flew from Columbia, South Carolina to Chicago. We ran into some bad weather and had to be rerouted to Chicago through another way to go around the weather. And it caused us to be late. We missed our flight to Shanghai. And it caused us to go to, uh, they rerouted us, I'm getting rained on right now, but it rerouted us to um, San Francisco and from San Francisco to Shanghai, but it put us seven hours late getting to uh, Shanghai. Normally, <clears throat> we get to Shanghai sometime around one to two o'clock, which gives us all afternoon to get where we need to go. This time, <clears throat> excuse me, it put us so late that we were on the subway headed to our hotel in Dan, downtown Shanghai around 10 to 11 o'clock. I knew how to get there, I've done it before, but we got thrown a curve and what happened was the subway system shut down at 11 o'clock. Now not all the subway, but the line that we were on shut down at 11 o'clock. We were told you have to get off the subway go above ground so at 11 o'clock actually by the time we got above ground it was 11:30. we were on the streets of Shanghai trying to figure out how we get to our hotel the adventure <clears throat> just began then and uh, we had we got a taxi of course we were too far to walk it was too far to walk to the hotel from where we were we got a taxi we were not able to communicate. I showed the taxi driver the, a map where the hotel was. Thought that was good enough that he'd be able to take us there, but he was very confused about where the hotel was. He ended up stopping somebody and talking to somebody on the street who was served as an interpreter. And uh, he ended up taking, taking us to the metro station or the subway station where we would have gotten off. Pointed it out. I started to get out of the cab, but before I could, he whipped the taxi around and took off like a bat out of hell back the direction we came. I felt like we were being shanghaied in Shanghai, but um, he kept going. I protested. I wanted him to stop. Uh, of course, I was speaking English. He didn't understand, but he knew I wanted out. I wanted out of that cab. I told my wife to get ready to get out uh, when we had a chance. We got a chance at a stoplight where he had to stop. We jumped out, we got our luggage out. I paid him. I didn't know how much I owed, but I went ahead and paid him 30 RMB and he seemed pleased with it. 
We ended up, the, the bottom line to that story is we ended up asking for directions to a young, if you ever need directions, stop a young Chinese guy on the street. He generally will be able, knows enough English to where he can communicate with you. And actually the taxi driver had figured it out and was trying his best to get us to the front door of the hotel. We walked into the hotel, it was a few blocks away. Uh, after midnight, my daughter had called ahead and made sure they knew we were going to get there. We still wanted the room, so they were holding the room. Everything worked out, but it was quite an adventure. Then on the return trip, we have a three-hour bus ride from Hangzhou to Pudong Airport in Shanghai. We were one hour into the bus trip when the bus filled with smoke, and we had to peel out of the bus, get our luggage, and stand on the side of the interstate for probably 45 minutes, something like that, until another bus came to pick us up. The adventure didn't end there though, and uh, what happened was we got our tickets, we were going through security, we were going through Chinese customs. I went first, which was a mistake. I should have gone last. I'll remember that let my wife go first each time. But I went through, no problem. I was standing on the other side of customs waiting for my wife to go through. They would not let her through because she had dropped her plane ticket and didn't know where it was. So someone back in the crowd said they had seen it, and, but they didn't know where it was, what happened to it. Nobody could find it. He made her go back. I tried to get through the line to go help her, but he wouldn't let me through and in fact ordered me to stay back behind a yellow line. You can't go backwards through customs. So for about a half an hour, I didn't know what was going on. She went back. She actually found a lost and found area, and uh, they had the ticket. Someone had turned it in. So that was, it ended okay, but there for about a half an hour, I didn't know what was going to happen, whether she was going to be stranded in Shanghai or not. So it was a real adventure, and like I say, we go through a phase where we say that was just too painful, we don't want to do that again. I'm sure we'll go back, I'm not sure when. Now, I meant to bring out here something to show you the water samples that I collected. I made a ser series of videos and one was about the water quality in Shanghai. I did not get sick this time because all the water I drank was out of the Berkey water filter that I took with me to, to uh, Hangzhou. So we didn't get sick from water or an intestinal type disease. I did get a head cold and I'm still recovering from lingering effects of that head cold. But um, I had promised to do water quality testing and then bring a video on the water quality from that hotel. A couple things came up. I'm not going to do the water testing. I still have the samples, but I'll probably just pour them out. I'll, I'll keep them a little bit longer in case something happens. But number one, this was unexpected. Berkey contacted me. They watched the video. They contacted me and said they would not stand behind any water testing of the Berkey filtered water that I took because I didn't collect the sample correctly. Now that struck me as odd. I mean, I don't, I have collected water samples professionally, but through uh, jobs that I've taken, so I had some idea of what I needed to do or not do, but they said that water that they test is collected as it drips from the Berkey filter, the black Berkey filter. So that's where you collect the sample. That's impractical because you're getting it drip at a time, drip, drip, drip. And what you drink is coming out of the Berkey spigot. They claim that the Berkey spigot might be contaminated somehow. So if you collect it just out of the spigot, you know, it might be contaminated. Whereas if you collect it straight out of the filter inside the the uh, canister that it might be different. I don't buy that because what you drink is out of the spigot. But anyway, so they said that they would uh, not stand behind the uh, s any testing that I would have done of their um, water, their filtered water. I went to an independent lab and basically any test that I ran was going to cost fifty dollars per test two samples, $25 per sample. They wouldn't help me out on that. And so basically to run the test that I needed to run, it was gonna be on the order of $500 and it's just not worth it to me. I didn't get sick this time. I drank Berkey water. 
filtered water, I didn't get sick. So as far as I'm concerned, that's, a, that's as good a sign as I need that, that it did help. But I will not be running doing a follow-up video on the water quality. Now the last thing I want to talk about, and this I think is getting to be too long, but I'll try to cover this quickly, is a video that I made right before I went to China. And I was in a rush to make that video, mainly because it was getting late in the day. I did it after getting home from work in the evening. And I only had an evening or two before we were leaving for China, and I wanted a tree down in my yard. It was a dead tree. Go back and watch that video if you don't know what I'm talking about. But it was a rush job, and I will say it was a slack job. I was in a rush, and I was nervous because I was filming myself. I've never done that before when I took down a tree. So it was a rush job. It was a sloppy job. My normal crowd watched it and said, hey, way to go. And, uh, you know, that's sort of what I'm used to, you know, very positive comments. But then it got into the tree service crowd, the urban crowd that takes down trees for pay. And I had priced taking trees down in my yard before. And generally, it's going to be four to $500 to take that size tree down, cut it up, and haul it off. That was too much, and so that's why I ended up doing it myself. Now, I'm not an expert when logger. I'm not a logger. I'm a forester. I grow trees. I don't harvest them. But I've cut plenty of trees in my life. I depend on firewood, so that's, you know, five to ten trees a year that I cut for firewood. And I've taken 30 of these mature pines out of my yard since I've lived here. I've never had an accident. Now, I'm not an expert, but obviously you don't need to be an expert to take a tree down. You know, I didn't use PPE. Well, I probably should have, but I don't wear seat belts. Or I just started wearing seat belts a year ago because I got three tickets in a row for not wearing seat belts. So I decided it was time for me, finally, to wear a seat belt. But, you know, you don't have to be an expert to take a tree down. But the initial response to that video was positive but then when it got into this logger tree cutter tree service crowd I mean they were just foaming at the mouth because here was a landowner who was doing his own work and they didn't like it I got called everything from a greedy SOB to a college educated idiot and everything in between let me slow down and take a drink well I like I don't delete comments. I don't on my videos, unless somebody is particularly vulgar, I don't delete comments because I think that speaks to them more than it speaks to me. But the negativity, I had 25,000 views on that one video in three days, and it was overwhelming. That's, I've never had that kind of response to any of my videos. And the comments that were being left uh, I immediately deleted ones that were just plain vulgar, but then I left a lot that were very um, negative. But, you know, after a while, I'm mentally pretty strong, but after a while, you know, how often do you have to be called an effing idiot, you know, before it starts getting to you? I started deleting comments, which made that crowd even matter. And uh, I even had a threat that the channel was going to be taken down if I didn't delete that video. Well, you're not going to threaten me. I mean, I may lose the channel, and something did happen. I muted the person who made the threat, and I got mad and went through and deleted probably half of the comments that were made. So there's still some negative comments up there. But, you know, I tried to use a sense of humor. The guy that called me an effing idiot it had his picture there, his, his uh, channel picture, which was a picture of him, his name, which he used his actual name, I guess, and then under it, you know, F an idiot, which he was calling me, but I just responded, you shouldn't be so hard on yourself, because it looked like he was calling himself that, actually, when you looked at it visually. But uh, I went back and deleted all most of the negative comments and I put it for the first time to where no comment can be made without my review and approval on that video I, pr I hope I never have to do that again but as far as I'm concerned I'm just a guy taking down a tree in my yard and my experience is that I've never had an accident before I am watching more videos someone asked 
why, with all my experience or with YouTube, why I didn't watch videos on how to properly use PPE and take down a tree so that I was a better example for y'all. Well, I got to thinking about that and it really caused me to think, but when I was in the business of taking down trees, not for a living, but as a sideline business, a weekend job, YouTube wasn't around. That was back in the 90s. And YouTube internet was in its infancy. Al Gore had just invented it, but YouTube wasn't around. I didn't start getting into YouTube, I don't know, much later, maybe 2006, 2007. And so back when I was doing it, it was just, um, you know, uh, YouTube wasn't around. There wasn't an easy source to go to for advice on how to do it like it is now. And so, um, and now I don't intend to take down another tree and I haven't for five, six, seven years. When one dies and I, I ha end up having to take it down, I guess I just don't think I've taken down so many trees that I can't do it. I was confident that tree was coming down where I wanted it and it came down within four feet of where I predicted and I predicted the damage. It was either gonna hit that cedar tree or the lower pedalum. I'll quit ranting about that, but it really bothered me. Just for the record, I'm not an expert on anything. I'm not an expert on tree cutting. I'm not an expert on coffee, but I have drunk a lot of coffee in my life, and I'm not an expert on English either, so that may not be the proper way to say it, but I think you understand what I'm saying. I've drunk a lot. I've had a lot of coffee in my life. I know what I like, and I like this cup of coffee. I like this kick-ass coffee. And I think you'll like it if you like a smooth cup of coffee that's strong, has a little bit of a sweet smoky taste to it, which is unusual. I've never had a cup of coffee that I would use those adjectives to describe it. But I'm not an expert in tree cutting, coffee tasting. Most of my channel is about handguns and knives and gear review, and I'm not an expert in those. I only got into it back in the recession because I felt like the economy was going to collapse, and if you didn't have some way to protect yourself, you know, so I was an average Joe out there trying to review all the guns out that were on the market and decide what should be my first gun, and that's sort of what got me started. I figured if I'm trying to figure this out, there's a lot of other people trying to figure it out too, so I would post my analysis of it, and uh, things have grown from them. I like making YouTube videos, you know, I've felt uneasy for the past month and I think one reason is because I haven't been making YouTube videos. I got in the habit of doing this every Saturday morning and uh, I broke out of that habit mainly because of that tree cutting video. It was so negative and the response, the response was so negative that it just sort of, you know, I would start to make a video and I'd, I'd basically think hell no. You know, and so anyway. Let's end it on that note. I, I wish it was a more positive note. The positive note is this is a good cup of coffee. And I appreciate that coffee cup. Some of you may not be aware, but it was sent.